This is flipped mini lecture number 14, covering night section 6.4, which is all about friction. And static friction, kinetic friction, and rolling friction are the three types that we're going to talk about. So, if you have a plane, just drawing it here at some arbitrary angle, doesn't really matter what the angle is, I could label it. But anyway, you have a plane. And you have some object. For simplicity, let's make it a box that's sitting on the plane. Well, you can always choose your coordinate system however you like. And in this case, it often makes sense to choose the coordinate system parallel to the plane. Or I might call that the positive x direction and that the positive y direction. And the plane is going to push on the box somehow or other. The plane is in contact with this box, and it's going to push in some direction on this box, depending on what the box is doing. But we can always choose to resolve that into whatever that vector is, and I'm going to draw it arbitrarily. We can always choose to resolve that vector into a component that is parallel to the x-axis and a component that is parallel to the y-axis. We put the x-axis parallel to the plane. So what that means is a component that's parallel to the plane and a component that's vertical to the plane. And whatever this component of this vector is that's vertical to the plane, we call that n the normal force. And whatever this is here, the component that's parallel to the plane, Knight calls that lowercase f. And then he's got three different versions, s, k, and r, and we want to talk about all three. So let's see what Knight has to say about fs. I've redrawn our box as a point, like we do for free body diagrams. And I've got my normal force here, which is the definition of that is however the plane is pushing on the point, whatever amount of it is pushing in the direction perpendicular to the plane. And then I've drawn my FS here. And if you look at what Knight has to say about FS, in equation 6.11, he says, FS will be whatever it takes to prevent the box from moving. Because remember, Fs is the static friction, which by definition means the friction that you get when you're not moving. So Fs will be whatever it, it takes to counterbalance whatever other forces are acting in this direction. But of course, at some point, our box is gonna break loose from the plane. And Knight has a formula for that, and he says, the maximum amount of Fs is like this. Fs max is how he writes it. The maximum amount of Fs is mu s n. Now I want to stop here for a second and just make sure that you don't think I'm just being sloppy when I write this. Because all of a sudden I've got Fs with no hat, symbolizing that it's a vector on top of it and n with no like little stylized arrow symbolizing that it's a vector. So what's going on? Well, fs is equal to the magnitude of fs. And that's just a definition. It's a nice way of writing the magnitude of fs without having to write this extra bunch of goop. And n here, similarly, is the magnitude of n. And that's how we write the length of this vector without having to put this extra goop all the time. So this equation, fs max equals mu s n, is definitely not to be confused with some equation like that, which wouldn't even make sense. fs is a vector in the horizontal direction, and mu s is a number, and n is a vector in the 
perpendicular direction, and there's no way that fx max can ever equal n. So what Knight is saying here is that the maximum amount of the static force is equal to something that he calls the coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force. In other words, the harder the block is pushing against the plane and the harder the plane is pushing back against the block, that is the bigger this number is right here, if, and this is a constant, then the greater the maximum amount of static friction that this situation can generate is. And then if you try to push the block harder than that, it breaks loose. And then all of a sudden, we're in a skidding case. The only thing that changes in the skidding case is this changes to F kinetic. And the skidding case turns out to obey a pretty nice simple formula, except it's got mu k times the magnitude of n. And once again, of course, we can write this uh, magnitude of fk as just fk, and then we have fk is mu k n. And this says that the, the frictional force when you're skidding is some constant coefficient that we call the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction times the normal vector. In other words, when we're pushing down hard on something, here I'm going to push this eraser against the board, I'm leaning against it. When we're pushing hard on something, it slides rather difficulty. And if I'm pushing lightly on something, it slides rather easily. So the amount of frictional force that is able to be generated in resistance to the direction of motion, F kinetic, is proportional to how much the thing is being jammed against whatever is generating the friction. I did mention that there's one more thing, and I had an F sub R. What is that? Because that hasn't even entered our taxonomy before. F sub R. Well, Knight wants to make one more special case. This is not for a box. This is for something that's rolling. So let's say you have a wheelbarrow. And it has a front wheel here. It's on, mounted on some axle. And the wheel is going along the ground as you're pushing the wheelbarrow along. Wheelbarrows usually have back legs too. So you're pushing this wheelbarrow along and this wheel is turning. Now, of course, this thing isn't perfectly frictionless. Even though the wheel is freely turning, there's something that happens as the uh, wheel sort of mashes into the pavement, then gets a little flat spot on it, and then moves, and then that spot that was flat for a moment moves up the backside, and then some new rubber comes down and flattens out against the pavement and goes up against the black backside. Now, whatever that sort of mashing action is, it causes a little bit of resistance. And that's what uh, Knight calls rolling resistance. And he labels that F sub R. And F sub R is also uh, kind of opposing the direction of motion. And the magnitude of F sub R, quite by analogy with the others, he calls mu sub R, the coefficient of rolling resistance, times the normal force, which once again says the more you have, say, in this wheelbarrow, or the more you're mashing down on that front wheel, the more resistance it's going to put up as you roll forward. Some of Knight's problems uh, will use the actual values in table 6.1, which has some typical coefficients of static friction, coefficients of kinetic friction, and coefficients of rolling friction. A really important thing to keep in mind about these is that the coefficient of kinetic friction is always less than the coefficient of static friction. For example, rubber on dry concrete, he says that the coefficient of static friction is 1.0. 
Whereas the kinetic friction, which would be that same rubber skidding on dry concrete, has a coefficient of 0 0.8. So basically, once you're uh, pushing on something and then it breaks loose, it gets easier. And if it comes to a halt again, then actually the, the force can build up a little higher than when it has broken loose. And actually, that is the principle behind anti-lock brakes. The whole point of anti-lock brakes is to, any time the wheels start to lock up, is to slightly release the amount of uh, braking power. You slightly reduce the amount of braking power right as you're detecting that the wheel's about to skid. And by actually backing off, you get a little more braking action than you would if you let the wheel lock up and go into a complete skid. There are actually no end of problems you can build now that you've got gravity and some formulas for friction. And in Wednesday's class, we'll do three of those, I hope. Um, and then on Thursday's class, we'll be already ready to move into the next and final section of chapter six which is called drag. And drag is not quite the same thing as friction, and you'll see that. Looking even further forward, what's coming uh, after that is chapter seven. And in chapter seven, we're gonna get into what's called Newton's third law. Because so, you already have a lot of examples here of uh, Newton's second law in action. And now we've got one more of Newton's absolutely amazing triumvirate of laws to understand. And then we can just keep adding more and more interesting cases in subsequent chapters once we have all three of Newton's laws at our disposal.